Today, for our Experts in Emotion interview, we'll be speaking with Dr. Judith Moskowitz on emotion and physical health. Dr. Moskowitz is an Associate Professor in Residence in the Department of Medicine and the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. She received her PhD in Social Psychology from Dartmouth College and her MPH in Epidemiology from UC Berkeley. Her research is focused on coping and emotion in the context of chronic stress. In particular, she studies the impact of positive emotion on psychological and physical adjustment to serious stress and illness. Using both quantitative and qualitative methodologies, she examines how caregivers and those with chronic illness appraise and cope with the illness-related stress and how those processes are related to well-being. Dr. Moskowitz is the PI of an NIH-funded randomized controlled trial of an intervention designed to increase positive affect during a stressful health-related event, such as testing positive for HIV. She's modifying the positive affect intervention for high school and middle school students, people with type 2 diabetes, women with stage 4 breast cancer, and university employees, and testing in-person and online approaches to delivering the intervention. So I now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview, together with Dr. Judith Moskowitz on emotion and physical health. Welcome, Judy. Thanks for speaking today. Thanks. I'm, I'm happy to be invited to be part of the series. Hmm. What I wanted to start out asking you about was a little um, about your journey into the world of emotions. So where did it first get started for you? Well, it started, I think, for like it is with a lot of people. It started in graduate mm -hmm. school. Um, I went in really interested in health psychology and the effect of stress on health, which it uh, led me directly to the work of Lazarus and Folkman and looking at stress and coping theory and emotion is an integral part of that theory. Um, and as I started doing some research in the area, um, uh, the, my interest in sort of differentiating between positive and negative emotion and the differential effects started to emerge. So working with my advisor at Dartmouth, Jay Hall, um, he was also uh, really get into, getting into structural equation modeling at the time. So we started looking at the structure of coping and the structure of emotion and started really looking at uh, positive emotion and negative emotion as separate concepts at that point. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's been, you know, a good 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and over that 20 years, you've done, I think, so many exciting things in this realm. So I just want to ask you to speak a little bit about them because I know a lot of people listening to this conversation are really interested in thinking about the fact that emotions can actually, you know, tangibly affect really important physical health outcomes. So, I mean, one area among many that you've done is um, your work where you're really well known for this influential work on the predictors and consequences of positive affect. Uh, in the context of health-related outcomes, such as chronic stress. And I wondered if you could say a little bit about what you see as the most important discoveries here in your work. Well, I think the, the core discovery that positive emotion does have a unique role um, in health and mm -hmm. that um, it, it influences really important health outcomes like mortality. Um, that was really where I started with this work, sort of, um, looking in other data sets, earlier data sets that where the data had already been collected, and looking for this unique relationship. And once we found the relationship between positive emotion and longer life, um, that opened up a whole world of possibilities for looking at, well, okay, so yeah, it's great you live longer, but what leads to that and sort of all the steps in between? Is it health behaviors? Is it immune function? Is it other um, biological mediators that we have yet to really understand? Um, so at that point, I think things really opened up. But the, starting with you know positive emotion leads to longer life, which is fascinating, right? Because most people might have thought of positive emotions as just kind of this epiphenomenal thing that happens, but that you showed actually really drives you know important health outcomes. Huge. Yeah, yeah, it was really exciting. It's the the only time you know of the millions of analyses I've done where I literally jumped out of my chair and ran into someone else's office and said, "Look, it's really there. It's really true." So it's been really exciting and really launched a lot of um, work that I'm you know our whole team is really passionate about. 
Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, I mean, have you found distinct kinds of predictors when you looked at varied populations? I know you've studied caregivers, people newly diagnosed with HIV, as well as those with pancreatic tumors. Are you finding distinct effects in these groups, or is there a common theme across? Um, we're not at a point with our intervention work where we're seeing uh, differential effects based on the mm -hmm. type of illness or the type of stress. My gut instinct is that the illness or the, um, the particular stressor that uh, the sample is dealing with is not going to be the key thing driving the outcome. I actually mm -hmm. think they're probably, the, the question of um, when is positive emotion um, a key predictor of health and um, for whom is it a key predictor, I think it's going to come down more to personality variables. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's too early in our data to to see that, um, but that's that's my gut of where things are headed. So interesting. It seems like there's so many like exciting unknowns too on the horizon. Yes, yeah. It's a huge, um, huge new territory for research, I think. So I wanted to ask you then about this seminal work you've done um, examining these positive affect-related interventions um, aimed at helping reduce stress across a variety of populations. And I wondered if you could say, in your opinion, what you see as some of the most essential ingredients of these interventions that's making them work in really amazing and maybe surprising ways. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um our basic idea is that, so we, we've developed this intervention that has eight or called skills for increasing positive emotions, sort of on a daily basis. Um, even if you're experiencing stress, we think that these skills can help you um, increase your daily experience of positive emotion and help you cope with the stress better, no matter what the stress is. Right, so the idea is that we are giving people this toolbox, this buffet, this a selection of skills to choose from. Um, the real trick is that you then have to practice the skills, like make it a habit. Um, so where we're really headed with this is not so much that you know we think that mindfulness is the key thing, or positive reappraisal is the key thing, or noticing positive events, or gratitude. We think all of these things can work. Um, if you make it a habit. Um, so where our work is really heading now is trying to figure out how to help people engage in these skills and, and make them part of their daily lives and part of how they think about the world and how they view the world. Um, so, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of really good work being done out there that looks at um, a lot of these skills sort of individually. And I think that work is all really important and um, should definitely be pursued. But for our main questions, it's more about, um, we, we think there's enough evidence for each of these skills for it to be included in the package. But now we're moving forward and trying to figure out ways to deliver the intervention and to make it um, appealing to people and make it and help people stay motivated to um, engage with the skills. Yeah, so when I think about different kinds of individuals engage, uh, engaging with these skills, do you find that certain individuals are benefiting more from certain skills than others, or some individuals may not be benefiting from certain components? Um, um, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of individual differences in how much people like the skills and how much okay. people practice the skills. And again, our work, uh, most of our studies are at a very early pilot phase where we're just trying to deliver the skills and have them understand it and, and looking to see if people are practicing. We have um, one large trial going on now that'll be um, probably about 160, 175 people newly diagnosed with HIV wow. and half of them will be um, given the skills. And that, once the data are in for that study, we'll have more of a sense of really, you know, we'll be able to look at the data and see um, are there, what are the individual differences that drive who takes up which skills and what works and for whom? I can tell you anecdotally that there are some people who, it, and, and it's surprising to me when we put together the eight skills, there are some, there's something for everyone, almost without exception, so that people can find one of those eight that really speaks to them. Um, and at the same time, there's usually one that they just can't stand. Or they say, oh, yeah, I already do that. And they have no interest in, in um, really looking at it and trying to make it more of a habit. So um, I think mindfulness is probably the best example in terms of people love it 
Or then there's also people who just hate it. They hate the breathing meditation. They hate the bell. They hate everything about it. So, um, yeah, it's been really fascinating to, to listen to. And we get a lot of participant mm -hmm. feedback because we're piloting so much of this. Um, but it's been really fascinating to hear people mm -hmm. really radically different responses um, to the individual skills. Have you found any individuals respond in a way where they have skepticism about how can I be building positivity in an authentic way that's not promoting this kind of, you know, Pollyanna view of the world that, you know, everything is fantastic and great? Right. And we are really careful to yeah. um, not uh, not be Pollyanna about yeah. this. So we really, and again, coming from um, a background in stress and coping research, we're very aware that, you know, life is hard and really bad things happen. And we aren't minimizing the real negative consequences and the real stress that people experience. So we're really careful to um, honor the stress that they're undergoing and we're explicit about it. So in our work with people with HIV, we acknowledge that they are, you know, participating in the study because they've just been diagnosed with a really serious illness. And we do not um, in any way encourage them to uh, suppress their negative emotions or deny that their life is stressful or that what they're going through is stressful. Um, instead, we really point to the data and we say that, you know, we've, we've done a number of studies now of people uh, experiencing really serious stress. And what we see is that even though there is a lot of distress and there is depression, there is sadness and there's fear and anxiety, there's also a uh, positive emotion alongside that. And that um, people re reported this to us. We didn't go in looking for, uh, for reports of positive emotion, but this is what the participants were telling us. So when we're trying to teach people the intervention, even though they're going through a really significant stressful event, we, we give them the data and we say, you know, there, it is possible to feel the positive alongside the negative. So what we're trying to do is teach you skills for making more room for the positive. Hmm. So almost finding that balance as opposed to just being completely skewed in one way that's Pollyanna. It's balancing the positive with the reality of the negative stress that they're facing. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I think, you know, and the field has sort of swung back and forth on this as well. As you yeah, know, it's, yeah. um, you know, for a long time, psychology was really focused on the negative, And that's important, and it continues to be important. And we need to figure out ways to reduce um, out-of-control negative emotions. Sure. Um, and then we started discovering that positive emotions had these sort of unique beneficial effects. So then, you know, to some extent, we swung maybe too far in the other direction. We're like, well, let's just all look at positive emotion and see what we can do there. But, you know, extreme positive isn't good either. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So it's the balance and finding the balance and, and helping people find that balance. So it makes me think about, you know, the volume that you and I have been co-editing, um, the titled The Dark and Light Sides of Positive Emotion um, with Oxford University Press, really thinking about these, you know, two facets of the ways in which positive emotions can have all these robust benefits for us, but when taken to an extreme or experienced in the wrong context, may actually be maladaptive for us. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, you know, from your perspective, I mean, you and I have had a lot of conversations about this, you know, in what way can positive emotions really have these two sides, right? I mean, it's, I think, counterintuitive to a lot of people that really see positive emotions, you know, as, as a way through which you experience all these fantastic, robust effects. And how could there be a dark side? Right, right. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's, the, again, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm in our work, we're really careful to acknowledge the dark side and acknowledge that this isn't all about positive emotion and certainly clinically um, you can swing way too far in the positive direction. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the studies we're working on right now with uh, Sherry Johnson at Berkeley is mm -hmm. um, uh, modifying and tailoring our positive affect intervention for people with bipolar disorder because there's a real question for people who are at risk for mania do you want to give them skills for experiencing lots of high activation positive emotion? Mm -hmm. And a number of our skills, um, things like um, goal setting, um, are uh, particular, uh, particular weaknesses for people with bipolar disorder. So we're, we're tailoring the intervention to try to um, um, help people with bipolar disorder have have more positive emotions so they're not engaging in this sort of dampening coping response again that Sherry and her team have found that 
people with bipolar tend to avoid all positive events and it really impacts their quality of life. So what we're trying to do is, is give them skills for um, finding sort of the lower activation positive affect so they can have the experience of positive emotion and the benefits with it without the real dark side of the really high activation positive that can then spin out of control. And I think, you know, more generally that this is true for everyone. That Again, it's, it's the balance that you talked about um, and finding a place where if you're experiencing a significant life event, you're not, um, you know, drowning in the negative emotion um, that's, you know, adaptive and useful in many cases but you're not you're not overcome and overwhelmed by it and that the positive if you can practice some of these skills and bring more of the positive emotion in as well maybe you can find that balance yeah so it sounds like when you think about the implications for emotion and physical health more generally it's this theme of just finding balance right and if there's a relative deficiency in positive emotion maybe bumping it up a little but if there's an excess in positive emotionality kind of attenuating it or curbing it down a little to find that safe kind of sweet spot Right, exactly. And, you know, like everything in psychology, mm -hmm. it's probably really complicated on an individual level. And mm -hmm. your sweet spot is probably different from my sweet spot is different from the next guy's sweet spot, right? Yeah. So helping people find their individual optimal balance, I think, is going to be one of the big challenges going forward. So then when you think about going forward and sort of see the future of emotion and how it relates to physical health, where, where do you see the future headed? Well, one of the things I'm really excited about is um, this uh, movement toward uh, mobile health and health information technology and being able to use various types of sensors or things on your cell phone or ambulatory measures to really get at both health in the field, you know, and health indicators in the field, but also getting at emotion measurement in the field. Um, I am definitely a fan of self-report emotion. I think that people are very capable of reporting how they're feeling, and I do think it's still the gold standard. Um, that said, there are a lot of um, drawbacks to self-report emotions, mm -hmm. particularly if you want to get at daily experience of emotion and moment-to-moment -moment experience of emotion. And I think if there are ways for us to um, uh, couple positive or self-report with um, some other sort of ambulatory um, measure that that will that will be a huge leap forward. So it is one of the things that we're experimenting with. Some of the things where you can get at like heart rate variability in the field. You can get at heart rate certainly. You can get at um, galvanic skin response. So um, uh, we're really excited about the possibility of being able to take all of these. Um, mobile or ambulatory measures that are non-self-report and, and, and bring them together in large samples and see uh, is there a strong enough correlation with self-reported emotion to be able to use these going forward. So that's, you know, today that's one of the things I'm really excited about. <laughs> no, that's really exciting. And I imagine you have a lot of students who will come to you and, you know, ask you for advice, you know, that they're thinking about embarking in this field. What should I do? You know, how should I spend my time? Um, what kind of advice do you give to students who are thinking about embarking in emotion? Um, I think, I mean, certainly the thing that stands out to me when I'm talking to a student is mm -hmm. if they've got a real passion for the question. Um, so my advice would be find the question that you get really excited about. Um, I think, you know, there's often a pull toward doing what's being done in your graduate lab or being done at your university and that's all really good and it's a way to get exposure but um, sometimes that overall question as interesting it may be may not be what's really exciting to you and I think uh, you know if you're gonna stay in it for the long term and there there will be bumps along the way and it's challenging to make a career in um, psychology or certainly in psychology and health mm -hmm. Um, you need a question that's going to sustain you and it needs to be something you're really passionate about and you can imagine studying forever. Um, so yeah, find, find the question you're really passionate about. I like that advice of finding your passion. <laughs> it's so important. Um, and I think that's a great note to conclude on that, you know, it's all about passion and science to keep it going for the long term. That's right. That's right. So thank you so much for speaking today, Judy. Thanks. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Great to see you. You too. <laughs> so this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Judith Moskowitz from the University of California, San Francisco.